Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Dr. Javier Pinilla Ibars, Senior Medicine Member and Head of the Lymphoma Section at the H. Lee Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. Welcome, Dr. Pinilla Ibars. Let's get started. So let's begin with uh, a discussion of the goals of therapy for patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So Harry, as, as you know, um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia is a disease of older people, a median age, seven, 72 year old, and all these people uh, may or have already multiple comorbid conditions. Mm, most of the time, 70 to 80 percent do they have those, right? So the goals of therapy is, is really have to be customized to each of these patients but for sure continue to improve and to maintain the quality of life of older population of patients who really have this disease is very, very important. No doubt that the quality of life can be achieved by really obtain very good responses or maintain these responses for a longer period of time. Tell us a little bit more about how you approach staging in these patients and prognostication. So this, the staging of a CLL is a very well defined for many years through our, you know, the Ray classification and the Vinet classification, where really um, differentiate like a early stage versus stages that patients require therapy. However, over the last 20 years, many more uh, prognostic factors has been incorporated to see how these patients are going to behave. What I mean is that diagnosis of CLL is very common, but most of the patients are diagnosis won't require therapy. However, when we study really certain genetic features like a chromosomal anormalities by fish analysis or IGBH status by you know, molecular techniques, we can really predict who are the patients who may require therapy sooner rather than later, and in some cases who are the patients who may never require therapy because they have very, very indolent course. So do all patients require therapy at the time of diagnosis? No, and it's exactly what I was uh, trying to really explain, right? So uh, most of the patients won't require therapy at diagnosis, right? However, over time, and depending on these pronostic feature by cytogenetics of IGHB mutated status, they may require therapy sooner or later. How do you decide when a patient requires therapy? What are the indicators? So that, that's a great point. So they, it's, it's very well uh, studied and uh, well documented. And in fact, last year we have the IW 2018 review criteria and pretty much didn't change from 10 years before. So we still really follow patients for a long period of times and when their cytopenias, uh, hemoglobin less than uh, 10, platelets less, less than 100, or really growth of uh, l uh, enlargement of the leaf nodes, splenomegaly, B cell symptomatology, that's pretty much the, the classical reason why we really decide to start to have the conversation about which therapies will be the more optimal for each patient. So in the rise staging system, it would be intermediate and high, high stage patients uh, and correct. not the stage zero patient. That's typically. correct, that's correct. And although the, the ray staging system is still is, is used for, for really the fine patient, how they're gonna behave, more and more we rely in this IW, CLL, uh, really criteria to start therapy. They're very, very well documented and we follow this rule. Well, you started a discussion about this, but um, why don't you uh, discuss what are the uh, diagnostic and risk stratification tests that you get at the time of diagnosis or when you're begin thinking about beginning therapy? That's a really good point, right? So some people can argue that diagnosis, a flow cytometry in peripheral blood may be good enough to really establish the diagnosis. However, some patients really want to demand how this disease is gonna behave. Right now, there is not really a formal indication to do all these plethora test diagnosis, but for sure before therapy. However, more and more people really um, want to really see how this disease is gonna behave. So right now, I think a fish analysis is really looking for the four most common um, chromosomal abnormalities, 13Q, trisomy 12, 11Q, and 17P, or TP53 mutation, is mandatory for sure before therapy. TP53 by sequencing is something that also is being incorporated as very, very useful a tool before start therapy. Because we know that there is certain patients who are not the lesion of 17P, but they may carry the TP53 mutation. And as you know, there's two different techniques. One is fish and one is sequencing, right? Beside that, I think the other very, very important base 
on the, the publication and based on the, the data that we have with the era of chemoimmunotherapy is the status of the IGHB in the surface of the B cell. So we know that mutated immunoglobulin genes are really behave more indolent and unmutated immunoglobulin genes are really more aggressive over the course of the disease. Yeah, I, th I, I think that's a very fine point of this mutational status of the immunoglobulin variable region gene. And um, I'm not sure many uh, practicing oncologists understand where that comes from. My understanding is about 50-50, about 50% 50 that, will have that's, mutated. That's correct, Harry, that's okay. correct. And, and what it really indicates is when the neoplastic transformation or where the neoplastic transformation occurred. Was it in a pre-germinal center that's exactly lymphocyte correct. or one that's already seen pre or, or post-germinal center? Yeah, post-germinal center. Those are the mutated and those are the ones that have a better prognosis. That's correct. Do you do karyotypic analysis? That's another uh, very interesting point. Uh, more recently, with the introduction of uh, target therapy, we really find out that karyotypic analysis is also maybe useful to really differentiate patients who may have higher risk to progress even in the presence of these new uh, target molecular drugs. So um, traditionally, we didn't do that because it's hard to really uh, have um, you know a conventional cytogenetics, but today with uh, techniques uh, with the use of CPG and IL-2, we can really have some metaphases. And obviously, in aggressive patients, is easily obtained, and we can really have a better, better characterization on how aggressive this disease may behave in the long term. So let me ask you a loaded question: How about a patient who is asymptomatic, does not have adenopathy, splenomegaly, low blood counts? but has a, a high risk score by P53 deletion or mutation or other features. Should that patient be treated early or should they still be watched? We still don't have no data to really suggest <coughs> that we should treat early on even in patient who has high pronostic feature. In this case, you almost refer to the IPI or CLL IPI score, mm -hmm. who really, really put a lot of emphasis in the IGBH unmutated TP53 or deletion of 17P. So those are the patients that we know that most likely they're gonna progress very, very soon after diagnosis. And sometimes it's not really uncommon to really see them a diagnosis that required therapy. However, right now we don't have no evidence as happened with historically with any other types of a CLL that treating this patient early can really prolong survival. It's true is that this is an uh, important uh, matter or important subject to investigation that for sure we're gonna really start to see in the next years in terms of clinical trials. Yeah, and exactly, uh, the NCI has actually approved a SWOG concept that was developed in the inner group looking at intervention for those patients with high-risk disease. Absolutely, and so. we're gonna see more and more, we have in our institution have another clinical trial asking the same question, should we intervene early in this high-risk patient, but we still don't know the answer.